In the introduction to her 1969 novel The Left Hand of Darkness, science fiction author Ursula K. Le Guin argues that science fiction is either extrapolative or a thought experiment. And even though this novel is 55 years old, looking back over the history of science fiction, that has always been true and continues to be true. By extrapolative, she meant that it reflects our modern day issues. Many, many science fiction authors are using their books, using their stories, their imaginations, to reflect the socio-political landscape in which they themselves live. And by thought experiment, she meant what if. So many science fiction stories are what if. Take something that is real now, take something that is perhaps an issue now, and ask what if that issue was in space? What if I created a scientific allegory for this issue or for that issue? The very first science fiction novel ever, Frankenstein, was about a lot of things. Fatherhood, morality, and the responsibilities of man, for example. But Frankenstein was also extrapolative. It explored the fears and the paranoias of the people at the time with regards to human scientific advancement and discovery. The fear of what we might find or what we might create. The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, which was published in 1898, was about colonialism. The aliens land in England, in London, and H.G. Wells is basically saying, how would you like it? I could go on and on and on, this has always been true. But what does that mean for the works of John Scalzi, who has a very unique kind of genius when it comes to science fiction? Let's talk about why I think his voice is so special and so unique and so important in the landscape of modern science fiction. American author John Scalzi has been writing good science fiction for decades, but I only discovered him recently and I am completely addicted to him. I recently read almost back to back three of his novels and I'm going to continue to read him until there is nothing left to read. Now, as I already made clear, science fiction is very much about imagination and it's also a very self-serious genre. By extrapolating on real world issues, science fiction takes on a particular tone of seriousness, looking at the social and political issues of the day, and creating imaginative but very, very serious and often very dark allegories and metaphors for those things. John Scorsese is unique in that he manages to do all of that, but often on a smaller scale, and almost always in a funny, tongue-in-cheek, excited, wide-eyed, and laugh-out-loud funny way, John Scalzi manages to inject so much fun, so much adventure, so much humour into science fiction without losing the intelligence, the kind of clairvoyant aspect of science fiction, and the sheer boundless imagination of the genre. That's what makes him so special. There are plenty of science fiction stories that are exciting adventures, and there are plenty that are thought-provoking, allegorical morality plays. His books manage to be both. That's his unique genius, and I am obsessed with it. So let's talk about the three that I've read so far, and what I think is so special about them. We'll start with The Old Man's War. This is the first book in a pretty lengthy series. I think there are seven books, and yes, I am planning on reading all of them. I cannot not do that at this point. But even though the series is long, the books themselves are not. This book is a tight and tidy 300 pages. And that is my first big congratulations to him, is that his books are always a reasonable length. His books often feel epic in scope, and this one certainly fits that bill, but it's not long. Scalzi seems to realise that epic and long are not the same thing. Just by writing a long book, it does not mean you've written an epic. He's written an epic in 300 pages. Old Man's War is set far in the future, but we don't know exactly when. No time is given. And that's the first thing that I really liked about this, because so many science fiction stories set a date. And sometimes we reach that date, the most obvious being 2001 A Space Odyssey. And even though it's a very minor thing, it does suddenly date the thing. Makes you realise what people thought was going to happen by this point. Back to the Future 2 is set in 2015. What? So this book is just set in the future. And in the future, humanity is colonising the stars. There are the humans who remain on Earth and live very ordinary, very recognisable kind of suburban lives. And there are the humans who live in space, who are off colonising planets, 
exploring and waging war against alien beings. Those on Earth don't know anything about what's going on in space. And we don't know that much about Earth as it is at that point. We learn a few things. For example, the fact that at some point the US went to war with India and dropped nukes. Information about that war is drip-fed to us to give a little bit of flavour and context and kind of nervousness, but that's all. The way that the book begins is that we have a suburban old man. His name's John Perry and to Today is his 75th birthday. He lives in a small suburban town in Ohio. He lived an ordinary life, a very recognisable life. You wouldn't know from his life that this is perhaps hundreds of years in the future. And on his 75th birthday, John Perry signs up to the military, which in itself is immediately a weird thing. And it's kind of the conceit of this novel, Old Man's War. See, about 10 years ago, John and his wife agreed to join the military when they hit 75, which is when you're allowed to sign up. Sadly, a few years ago, she suddenly died of a stroke while making waffles in their kitchen. He's been sad and alone ever since, and so he signs up. This military is up in space. The war that they will be fighting is against various mysterious alien races. And Americans can only sign up when they hit 75, and so there is an assumption amongst everyone that the people in space have some kind of technology that de-ages you, and that's why they sign up. They hit 75, they know they've only got a few good years left at best, and so they go, why the fuck not? I'm gonna sign up, and I'm gonna go fight a war in space, and hopefully get de-aged back to age 20, 25, and live a whole new life. Even if it's only for a few years and I die in a battle. But they also know that they only have to serve two years as long as they're not drafted into combat, and of course, John is. But they actually don't know any of these things for a fact. So much of this is hearsay. So John signs up, and off he goes. This is immediately a wonderfully imaginative thing. What a wonderful concept for a story. Old people who are recruited to fight a war out in space, which they don't even understand. For a mysterious earthling group called the Colonial Defense Force. And the fact that colonialism is so at the forefront of this conversation made me nervous the whole time I was reading it. These people are colonizers. What damage are they doing out in space? It made me frightened, but I was excited to see where it went and what message Scalzi was exploring here. And when he gets up into space, John Perry starts making friends. This is a real fun, found family kind of a thing. The people that he meets are charming and sweet, and you get a party of people to follow. Throughout the first act of the novel, there is training, there are things that they learn. They gain context about the Colonial Defense Force. They learn about this de-aging process, if that's what it is, I won't go into details. But John makes friends, he starts a new life, it is so wholesome and sweet, and these people are laugh out loud funny, it's a genuinely hilarious story. Until it's not. It gets dark, it gets sad, and there are revelations that are explored. But I laughed so many times reading this. There is joy in this novel. When these characters are de-aged, and you know it's going to happen, but how it happens is interesting, and I don't want to spoil that. But once it happens, they're young again, and they want to have fun. And so they all start having sex with each other. In the most hedonistic way possible, they are young again and they are living free. It is so lovely, so heartwarming, and genuinely funny as well. John Scalzi puts humour and goodness and lovable characters into science fiction. A genre that I love, but I concede so often misses those things. Sci-fi is often not funny. Sci-fi is often not about hedonism. But he injects a little bit of those things into his stories to allow the reader to enjoy those stories, while also being curious and thinking critically about the themes of the book. Because once John is drafted into a war, once he has to see combat, multiple revelations take place. And of course, I was waiting for this. I was excited to learn more about the colonial defense force? What evils are they perpetrating? What damage are they doing to the galaxy? This is very much not Star Trek. This is not exploring strange new worlds. This is not about meeting new civilizations and learning about them. This is about fighting wars against them and killing them. This is a brutal place. These are brutal people. But are they? Because we only get the human perspective. There's a wonderful moment where a character is skeptical and curious, as I was. He's up there, he's in a battle, and he says, like, is this good? It's a real are we the baddies moment. And so he tries to wave a white flag and stand up and declare peace and stop the battle. And in an instant, 
His body is pierced with a thousand needles that turn him to goo. It is shocking, it is genuinely funny in a really awkward and dark way, and it made me feel weird because I continue to question the colonialist nature of these humans. And I don't want to talk about any more, that was a minor spoiler I guess, I don't want to touch on any more. But you can see how Scalzi is having fun, is making us laugh, is making us feel a whole spectrum of emotion, many of them positive and happy, but is also still exploring very, very dark, complex moral things. The genius of John Scalzi is how he keeps the core of what makes science fiction intelligent and thought-provoking while having fun and making the reader laugh, and making his books real page-turners. He doesn't waste time, he doesn't waste space, this is an epic in 300 pages, and you will read it in a day or two, just ripping through it. You don't want to stop. You love these people, you enjoy being around them, and even the tragedy that you face is fun in a weird way. It's certainly addictive. And the Kaiju Preservation Society is another great example of that. Old Man's War was written in 2005, this is a far more recent novel. In fact, in the introduction, Scalzi talks about how when the pandemic hit, he was writing a much more serious story, a very, very dark novel, and he had to put it down. He couldn't bear to write it while the world was falling apart around him, and he was feeling very depressed and anxious. So he wrote something fun, something exciting, something very imaginative, and a real page-turner, and that is the Kaiju Preservation Society. Now before I forget to mention it, the first thing I'm going to talk about here is the fact that Scorsese is in his 50s at this point, maybe his late 50s, and the guy continues to be woke. He continues to adapt with the times. Old Man's War was written in 2005, and one of the main characters is gay. Good for Scalzi. Scalzi is a cishet white man living in Ohio. Not to shit on Ohio, I've never been there, but... <laughs> the Kaiju Preservation Society begins in modern day New York. Our protagonist is a cishet white man. Scalzi always writes cishet white man because that's what he knows, that's what he's comfortable with, it's his wheelhouse, good for him. But he also makes sure to do good representation. He recognizes not just the existence of other kinds of people, but also the normality of those people existing, people like me. And so when we begin in New York City in the modern day, our protagonist is living with two roommates, who are not only a gay couple, but one of them is a trans man. Immediate, good, happy, wholesome representation beautiful, love it, 10 out of 10, no notes. Once we get to all the kaiju stuff, one of the characters that we meet is an Irish non-binary person. The fact that they're non-binary never really comes up. The word non-binary is never used, they are just referred to with they, them pronouns all the way through, and that is it. That is literally it. They are them and that is it. It is not shoehorned in. It is not tokenism. That's the thing I really appreciate. I did not feel like a queer person was being tokened in any way. They just are. Thank you, John Scorsese, for seeing us, acknowledging us, and making us feel normal. Great. That's all it takes to be a half-decent ally. As for what it's about, well, the Kaiju Preservation Society is a lot of fun. I can't stress that enough. But again, it's also a book about our times. It's very much a book about unchecked, selfish capitalists. Our protagonist is working for a food delivery app like Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Just Eat, and all of those. And he gets fired right at the beginning by the boss himself, the billionaire CEO, son of a billionaire CEO. He gets fired from a pretty cushy job in the main office and spends the pandemic delivering food to other people around New York during a pandemic. The book begins in the pandemic. It acknowledges it. It is set within it. One day, one of the people that he delivers food to is an old friend from university. That old friend says, hey, I've got a job for you if you want it. The two of them, when they were at uni, weren't best friends. They just hung out occasionally, saw each other at parties, and they bonded over a love of science fiction. And this guy goes, hey, you turned me on to a lot of really great books back in the day. I'm gonna repay the favor by giving you a job if you want it. And all he says is that it's some sort of preservation society for looking after large animals. And so you kind of picture going out into the savannah, looking after elephants in some way, it's not clear. And he doesn't know until he gets there that what's actually going on is that he catches a flight to Greenland, steps into a mysterious kind of military base thing, and when he walks out, without even knowing it, at some point he passed through a portal into an alternate dimension full of kaiju. And he now works for the Kaiju Preservation Society. They are a global group of people who monitor, study, and protect the kaiju of this alternate dimension. But why do the kaiju need protecting? 
Well, because they're nuclear. In this alternate universe, kaiju have evolved to have nuclear reactors inside them. It serves multiple purposes. And this is the real genius of this novel, is the world building. Scalzi spends a lot of time on the biology of these things. He builds, plans out, and explains an entire ecosystem based around these biologically nuclear-powered kaiju and how it all works and how they function, how they mate, how they lay their eggs, how they fight and protect their territory, how they evolved in the first place, how they interact with the world around them. They are part of the ecosystem. They feed it and feed off of it. They are part of a food chain. It's all explained brilliantly. But the reason that humanity managed to find a way there in the first place is through nuclear activity. When a reactor melts down, it thins the barrier between these two worlds. And so on the other side, when a kaiju goes nuclear, say when it dies, that barrier is thinned again. And there's always the chance that the kaiju could come through. But the kaiju are not the real threat. We are, hence Preservation Society. As the story goes on, we find out more about how it's about capitalists and billionaires being awful, terrible people, which they all are. Every single billionaire is a terrible, awful human being. And this book liberally explores all of that. It has fun with that. It's a very satisfying book to read if you're an anti-capitalist like myself. And it's also 250 pages long. It crams in so much fun, so much world building, so many themes that reflect our current capitalist landscape. It has plenty of fun, it's a huge adventure, lots and lots of action because kaiju, and it does it all in 250 pages. Finally, I'm not gonna dwell on red shirts for too long because I think I've mentioned this book in three or four videos at this point. I'm addicted to this novel, I think it's incredible. I'm a big, big Star Trek fan and I think you'll get the most out of this book if you are also at least familiar with the tropes of Star Trek. It's called Red Shirts. If you know anything about Star Trek, you'll immediately get what it's about. This was the first Scalzi book that I read, and it also won the Hugo, I think in 2013. And I think I mentioned earlier about how Scalzi writes very politically switched on stories, very allegorical stories, but sometimes on a kind of smaller scale. And this is a really good example of that, because this scale is particularly small. This is a book of imagination a book of creativity, but on a very small scale. Because it itself is about imagination, it's about writing, it's about art and creativity. Rather than being about our political or economic systems, it's about the art that we create in the 20th and 21st centuries. How we write it, who this art is for, and what it does. So it's still a really big book, asking big questions, exploring big themes about the role of art in our society. Again, in a capitalist society, and it does go into capitalism a lot later in the book, but it's also just a really, really fun, clever, and satisfying story. Red Shirts is playing on a joke about Star Trek the original series. In the original series, you have a spaceship that travels from planet to planet, or space station to space station, whatever, and the ship is full of like 150, 200 people. But every single episode, an away team is sent down to the surface of the planet. That away team will be made up of a main cast member, usually the captain of the ship or his first officer, a member member of the bridge crew, or two of them, and a third random person wearing a red shirt, which means they are a lower ranking officer. And in that episode, that character in the red shirt will die very, very soon, very quickly. They will not have a single line of dialogue. They probably won't be given a name. They are a henchman, but for the good guys. They get killed off. It's not sad. No one cares. And we move on with the episode. They are a plot device at best. Red Shirts is about those people. Red Shirts is set in a world very, very similar to that of Star Trek. Several hundred years in the future, we are a spacefaring race. We fly around on starships. And our protagonist is one of a group who've all made it onto a very important starship like the Enterprise in Star Trek. They're all red shirts, they're all low-ranking officers. But when they get there and they start working, they start noticing some weird things, weird behaviors, especially from the captain and the other bridge crew members. And the red shirts in the lower decks, they've all noticed it too. They've developed conspiracy theories, they have ideas, they are trying to unearth what's going on with this weird behavior, and the fact that if a red shirt is sent down on an away mission, they will die. And in fact, there is a mathematical equation here, how likely they are to die, 
how quickly they will die, the probability of them surviving based on who they go down with, which bridge crew member, or how many bridge crew members. There's an equation here, how is that possible? This is just life, it's just random, but it's not, there's an equation. And then we have the weird scientific doodads that are used on the ship in order to randomly fix things when they need to be fixed. If a disease breaks out on the ship, a completely unknown virus, there will be a random, almost magical doohickey that will fix that virus. How is that possible? That technology doesn't exist. Our protagonist has never seen it anywhere else. Why is it on this ship? And why is it only used at that one moment to do that one thing? What's going on? It is fun, it is strange, it's exciting, and everything obviously eventually gets revealed, and I won't spoil it for you, but wow, what a journey this book goes on. And I can't spoil it for you, but I have to double down on the fact that this is very much about how stories are written, and how art is created, and who it's created for in our capitalist system. It's a fun book based on a joke about Star Trek that is full of fun and lovable, charismatic people that manages to still deliver a really fascinating and important point about art in our society. The unique genius of John Scalzi's books comes from the fact that he injects fun and laugh out loud humor and adventure into stories that are also very, very unique, imaginative, and politically savvy. These books are everything that Ursula Le Guin says that science fiction is, and more, because Scalzi doesn't forget the fun and the humor. If you enjoy science fiction for the way that it reflects our society, and the way that it asks big what-if questions, you'll find all of that in John Scalzi's works and you'll also laugh a lot. And quite simply, that makes him very unique, very special, and very important in the world of science fiction. I love this man, I love his books, and I'm going to continue to read all of them. I am fully addicted, and I think he is a very special voice in science fiction. Subscribe for books.